So, uh, Giri Mananda. And um, so this is how the Sutta goes. Uh, yeah. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anathapindika's monastery. Yeah. Now, at that time, Venerable Giri Mananda was sick, suffering, and gravely ill. So here we have Savati. Savati is the uh, capital of the Korsalan kingdom. Uh, and uh, Savati being the seat of King Pasenadi. King Pasenadi was one of the great supporters of the Buddha. He lived there. Uh, the Pindika's monastery was uh, also called the Jeta Grove. Uh, Jeta was a prince uh, who sold his uh, little park to Anatta Pindika. Anatta Pindika was a wealthy merchant. Uh, and there's a nice story about Anatta Pindika and how, uh, how he gained faith in the Dhamma. Beautiful story found in the Vinaya. And uh, I know because this is part of the translation work that I have done personally here. It's a nice, nice story of the faith of Anatta Pindika, a very faithful disciple here. And when uh, we go to India in December, uh, then uh, I, this is one of the places where we will go uh, to Antapindika's uh, monastery or the, actually the Savati. Yeah, also Antapindika's monastery, actually. Yeah. So Venerable Girimananda was uh, sick, suffering, and gravely ill. There's a few cases of this in the sutta as a monk being very, very ill and what happens then. Uh. Then Venerable Ananda went to the Buddha, bowed, uh, uh, sat down to one side, and said to him, uh, Venerable Sir, or Sir, Venerable Girimananda is sick, suffering, gravely ill. Sir, please go to Venerable Girimananda out of compassion. And uh, this is, I think I mentioned this before, is this idea if you want to invite someone to come to your house or to do something special, yeah, like, uh, you know, if you ask uh, like a senior monk, like Ajahn Brahma or whatever, you know, whether he, you know, when he's here, uh, yeah, if he comes here, I'm not sure what's happening with that one, Bobby. We'll see what happens. Uh, um, then um, uh, always ask in this way, please come out of compassion. Uh, because people who are uh, practicing this path really, you know, well, uh, they act out of compassion. That is kind of why they act in the world. Uh, and if there was no compassion, they would just sit in the cave and meditate all the time. Uh, so compassion is the way to, uh, uh, to invite people. Uh, it's interesting in its own right, a little kind of a little extra there. And then the Buddha says, Ananda, if you were to recite to the mendicant Girimananda these ten perceptions, it is possible that after hearing them, his illness will die down on the spot. Yeah. So uh, again, you recite certain perceptions, you recite a certain sutta, and then the illness will die down on the spot. It is interesting. He doesn't mention the uh, seven factors of awakening, which is the usual uh, chanting you do, the usual parita. Here, instead, he says the Giri Mananda Sutta. So why is that? Uh, and uh, it could be that the seven factors of awakening, maybe they are too profound for him to understand. Uh, maybe he's not an arahant yet. Maybe he's just kind of striving a little bit earlier on, on the path. Uh, and so he needs something a bit more simple to understand. Yeah. And so maybe that's why he, they recite this instead. And also interesting here, the Buddha says, it is possible that after hearing them, his illness will die down. The Buddha doesn't say, it will definitely die down. And this is one of those little things which is fascinating, because very often we think of the Buddha as someone who is omniscient, who knows everything about what will happen and what will work and what will not work. But uh, as you can see from here, sometimes things are just uncertain. Yeah? And maybe even the Buddha doesn't really know exactly what will happen. Uh, and in the Sutta, the Buddha is not really said to be omniscient in an ordinary sense. He has certain knowledges, uh, like the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, the knowledge of the workings of Kamma, the knowledge of the range of jhanas, and a few things like that that he knows. And the, the four intrepidities, or whatever it is called, uh, yeah, that he, no one can challenge him about certain knowledges. Uh, but uh, he's not really said to be omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Uh, and this is an example uh, of that, I think. Yeah. So, um, Giri Mananda. So, what are these ten perceptions? Uh, what ten? The perception of impermanence. Uh, the perception of not-self. Uh, the perception of ugliness, or if you like, non-beauty, if you wish. Uh, the perception of drawbacks, uh, the perception of giving up, uh, the perception of fading away, uh, 
the perception of cessation, uh, dissatisfaction with the whole world, uh, impermanence of all conditions, uh, and mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, so many of these we have seen already, uh, and so I don't have to say too much about them, uh, but some of them are new, we haven't seen before. Uh, yeah, like the dissatisfaction with the whole world is kind of a nice one. Uh, um, the uh, perception of giving up, pahana uh, sanya, is one you haven't seen before. Fading away is cessation. And then lastly here you have mindfulness of breathing. Mindfulness of breathing is here called a perception, uh, which is kind of interesting because normally in the suttas you don't find that. Uh, mindfulness of breathing is just a just mindfulness of breathing. It's a kind of mindfulness. Uh, yeah? It's a satipatthana, really. Um, but, of course, uh, mindfulness of breathing is also a perception because everything is ultimately a perception. You have to perceive things, otherwise it doesn't really, uh, it, it isn't anything at all. So arguably, you know, it can be called a perception as well, uh, but a perception that is uh, slightly different from the other ones. Uh. Uh, drawbacks is adinava, adinava sanya. Yeah, exactly. And then the pahana sanya, fading away is the viraga sanya, cessation is the nirvoda sanya. Dissatisfaction with the whole world is the sabbaloki anabhyakta sanya. Impermanence of all conditions is the um, sabbe sankara anicca sanya. Ugliness is asuba sanya, etc. I get given so much coffee, I can't drink it all. It's kind of, this is really heartbreaking, isn't it? Uh, the coffee kind of goes, uh, I'm not sure what happens to this coffee afterwards, but. Uh, all right. So are you ready for some of these perceptions? Yeah. yeah. So um, first one, what is the perception of impermanence? Uh, and this is kind of uh, interesting because this, uh, shows us the perception of impermanence from a slightly different angle than what we have seen before, which is always interesting. Yeah. So it starts off by, it's when a mendicant has gone to a wilderness, or to the root or the foot of a tree, yeah, or to an empty hut, and reflects like this. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting that it starts in this way, right? Because you would think that the perception of impermanence, you just have to think about it, or reflect on it, or contemplate it. Yeah. What does, that, what does it have to do with going to the wilderness, for goodness sake? Yeah, Isn't the BGF center good enough? Uh, we, can, <laughs> we have been talking about this now for a long time. Surely this will do. Um, but the point here, and this is, I think, a very important point, is that uh, these perceptions are very profound. Uh, yeah, And if you want to do it fully, we can do it partially by right here in the BGF center. You can do it partially, a little bit in daily life, like remembering your death and these kind of things. But if you want to do this fully uh, and you want it to really bite and you want it to have a real effect on you, then it has to be done in solitude. And this is kind of the idea here. So when we say gone to a wilderness, this is Aranya Gato. Yeah? Aranya is uh, literally not of the king, gone to the place, not of the king. This is wilderness. And uh, so... Um, in other words, outside of the cities, outside of the villages, outside of the built-up areas. That's what that means. The root of a tree is a similar thing. In ancient India, you would sit at the root of a tree. Yeah? Or even in the present day, some of these magnificent trees that you have here in Malaysia, yeah, where they kind of root, large root systems. And you can kind of sit inside the roots. It's like a little kuti. That's right, isn't it? You kind of go inside the roots, and that becomes like a kuti inside the roots. And there's so much foliage, you, don't, you probably don't even get wet when you go in there. I don't know, I've never done it, but uh, it would be interesting. Uh, so this is, or, or you go to an empty hut, Sunyagara Gato. Sunyagara, empty hut, empty house. So these are the places where you do your meditation. And um, the point here, and this is not obvious immediately to you, is that this is what you find whenever in the suttas you talk about real meditation practice, it is always prefaced by this particular formula. Yeah? When you, for example, when it comes to the anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing, 
or it comes to uh, other things as well, when meditation is serious, this is always first. In other words, this is, uh, it tells you, now we're getting serious about meditation practice. Uh, so this is what this is about. Uh, and so this is real meditation, it's profound. Uh, and uh, we saw before that the perception of impermanence is about the impermanence of the five khandhas, understanding the five khandhas, yeah, you know, the five aspects of personality. And those five per aspects of personality, now it is becoming more clear. That should be understood in the context of meditation practice. And the number one meditation practice in the suttas is anapanasati. So you understand the five khandhas in the context of watching the breath. And again, this makes the same point, that the idea of vipassana and samatha always go together. Yeah, they're not really separate. When you become peaceful, then you see clearly. When you see clearly, you become peaceful. They're not really separable at all. And the deeper your meditation is, the more you go to the foot of a tree or to an empty hut, and the more you meditate on the breath, the more will be, the higher, the greater will be your ability to see what is going on there. You will have that clarity of mind that enables you to penetrate the five khandhas and understand what they are. Yeah, yeah so this is kind of what is going on here. Samatha and Vipassana are going together, always moving together in this particular way. Yeah. So this is um, kind of one of the things you, you can see how you need to know the suttas to be able to get this information out of it. Yeah? If I didn't tell you, you might not have understood that yeah? because you're not really used to the suttas in a particular way. Yeah? So these things always go together. Yeah? And the samatha and vipassana are two sides of the same coin. If you want to find out how much vipassana you have, how wise you are, sometimes people say, I do vipassana meditation, I have all these kind of profound insights, and I go to the sankhara, upeka, jnana, and these kind of things. And this is kind of the um, various jnanas talked about in the Visuddhi Magga, the 16 jnana, vipassana jnanas, whatever they're called. And the way to know how profound your insight is, is to see how deep your samadhi is. Yeah, because if your insight is very deep, if you have a lot of vipassana, it means that you understand dukkha. And if you understand dukkha, you can reject things very easily because you know it's not worth holding on to. So deep wisdom always means deep samadhi. Yeah? So if you think that your vipassana is great, check out your samadhi, then you will know how deep your vipassana is. Yeah? So again, the idea is that two go together. They're not really separable. Yeah? Deep vipassana always means deep samadhi. Deep samadhi always means deep vipassana. They're not different things. They are qualities of the mind that are conjoined and go together. So, how does this reflection happen? It happens like this. Form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness are impermanent. That is what you reflect. And so they meditate observing the five impermanence in the five grasping aggregates, the Panchupadana Kanda. This is called the perception of impermanence. Yeah, how do we do that? And I will come back to this later on because we'll come to the Anapanasati uh, later on, also the Anapanasati Sutta. And how you do this is that you meditate, you become peaceful, and at the end of the meditation, you contemplate what has disappeared in that meditation. <clears throat> and what has disappeared is obviously impermanent. Yeah, and when it has disappeared, you feel happy, so it must have been dukkha. And sometimes it is gone completely, it is out of control, it's anatta. So you can uh, you see the three characteristics, but especially impermanence, uh, as a consequence of the depth of your meditation. It's actually very obvious, yeah? When you meditate, you become peaceful. Uh, you have better understanding of happiness and suffering as a consequence. Uh. Okay. What is the perception of not-self? It's when a mendicant has gone to a wilderness, to the foot of a tree or to an empty hut and reflects like this. So again, the uh, contemplation of not-self is also very profound and very um, takes a lot of insight and understanding, to, a lot of uh, peace of mind to be able to see these things clearly. Yeah. So again, it happens in an empty hut, etc. And then you reflect like this. The eye and sights. Ear and sounds, nose and smells, tongue and tastes, body and touches, and mind and ideas are not self. And so they meditate observing not self in the six interior and exterior sense fields. This is called the perception of not self. Yeah? How does this happen? 
And I'll just give you a brief idea how this happens. Uh, and uh, the way what happens is that, again, you are gone into a peaceful place, an empty hut or whatever. Uh, and then because you are in an empty place, you become very peaceful. The mind really becomes peaceful. And then the senses start to fade away, right? Uh, and as the senses fade away, then you start to understand that they are non-self because no longer you can no longer, they, you know, you are happy without them, and so they must kind of be, you start to understand the idea of non-self, that they are impermanent, and non-self kind of follows along as a consequence of that impermanence. But uh, the time when you really understand the non-self of the six senses, uh, this is not really enough to fully understand. It just gives you a small taste of what it means. Uh, but uh, the real time when you see it uh, is when you enter a jhana state, uh, and the five senses are completely absent. Uh, not only are they absent, but they are unattainable. You can't reach them anymore. They're out of reach. And anything that is out of reach, anything you cannot at will deal, you know, enjoy, that by definition is non-self. Because that which is self must always be attainable, almost something you can control. If you can't control it, if it is gone, then it is non-self. And so when you, and this is one of the reasons why entry into the deep states of samadhi is so difficult. Or not difficult, but challenging. Yeah? Because to be able to do that, you have to literally give up the idea of seeing. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, now I'm giving up sight and seeing. And as you enter, yeah, that giving up is as if you're going blind or something. Yeah? And you don't know if it's going to be permanent or not, right? So it's kind of a bit of a gamble when you go in. Maybe this is the end of it. Yeah? So you have to give up seeing and hearing. And this is one of the reasons why it is hard, because our attachment to our senses... At the very least, the ability to see, the ability to hear, uh, that is a very profound attachment. Uh, and it's kind of why it can be scary to enter these deep states of samadhi. Uh. But then when you are there, then the, again, there's no doubt. Obviously, this is non-self because you're no longer able to access these things. Uh. That is kind of the meaning of, one of the meanings of non-self. Uh. This is what you do. Yeah, so this is, again, quite profound. So... Um, but it gives you some idea what these things are about. Okay. Now we come to some easier ones. These are more the standard kind of contemplations. And these are earlier on, on the path. These are, this is like the Asuba Sanya. And this is the perception of the non-beauty of the body. Yeah, this is what this is about. And uh, this kind of perception is what you do if you want to uh, reduce some of the attachment to the body. Uh, would I recommend it? Uh, I would recommend it maybe to monastics, but I would not really recommend it so much to lay people. Sometimes you can if you are on retreat, maybe. Yeah, not like you go on a nine-day retreat or something, maybe at Jana go far away. You can maybe do this a little bit, but generally speaking, I would not recommend it because uh, it just goes against the... Uh, it just doesn't really work so well when you are embedded in the world, as they say. Yeah. So anyway, let's just have a quick look at it. Yeah. It's when a mendicant examines their own body, up from the soles of the feet and down from the tips of the hair, wrapped in skin and full of many kinds of filth. <laughs> so, but the Sujata's translation, he yeah. always comes up with some interesting stuff. Yeah. So... <laughs> So first of all, when you do the perception of the ugliness of the body, it's always about one's own body. Yeah, this is the first thing to understand. It. Uh, uh, imang evakaya. Imang evakaya is, means this very body, referring to one's own body. And uh, so up from the soles of the feet, down from the tips of the hair. In other words, the whole body, everything, wrapped in skin. The skin is like the outer surface, everything within the skin. Uh, and it's full of many kinds of... Uh, Phil, what is the Pali word for? Is it just asuba? Is it uh, many kinds of asuba? Uh, what the Pali word is? Uh, I think it might be. Uh, um, anyway, asuchi, ah, uh, impurity. That's right, asuchi. That's right. That's what it is. Yeah. So that means impurity. Suchi means pure. Asuchi means impurities. Uh, so filth is one way of putting it. Uh. So this is the contemplation. Yeah. So how do you do this? Well, this is what you do. Uh. In this body, there is. Head hair, body hair, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, 
undigested food, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, synovial fluids, and urine. And so they meditate observing ugliness in this body. This is called the perception of ugliness. So this is what it is. And uh, so, uh, again, I wouldn't particularly recommend it, but if, if this kind of thing is interesting for you, then uh, you, can, you can try. Uh, and uh, it is actually quite a powerful technique. It's not very hard. If you use this technique, uh, you lose attraction to the body fairly quickly, actually. Uh, it is fairly strong. Uh, you can uh, just imagine your body without uh, skin. Yeah, that's kind of often enough. Uh, and uh, straight away, that has kind of a powerful effect on the mind. Uh. So I think I will uh, stop there because uh, otherwise we are mind is not going to like any more of this. So uh, let's have a cup of tea, everyone. Have a, enjoy a cup of tea, and then we'll come back for some Q&A and a little bit of meditation towards the end. Yeah.